We've had no investment still from when we started to this point now. And we started with 1,200 quid. Because and I heard something about StockX that there are some fakes on there, right? Mm, I don't know, I don't want to get sued. When I first started, I posted for the first two years, three to five times a day for two years. To be the best, we need to be better every single day. We need to be yeah. better than yesterday. But like just having that confidence of we're the best. Well, today, one of the people that I've been wanting to speak to for a while now, Ben Gallagher. Welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me on. How you doing? Good. Yeah. Yeah. Just coming down from Liverpool today. Yeah. Snowy I know we get Liverpool. quite, yeah, snowing. Like four foot. I woke up this morning and I was like, whoa. But then as the day goes, I get up dead early. So yeah. it was still like middle of the night, basically. And it was snowing. And then as the day goes. What's early for you? Uh, so I get up at five. Well, four, 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 something like that. Have you always done that? Mm -hmm. Is that since you started, you know, being incredibly busy? Um, so like the last 18 months, mm. but it's so beneficial. Was it a conscious decision to do it or was it just a necessity? Um, it's like how to improve yourself in every aspect. Mm. Start with getting up early. <laughs> like those hours between five and nine before anyone gets in the office, you can do so much. But the reason we get up so early is because we go to the gym before work and me and my brother are big on. More so him, but I've kind of like got it from him. It's like do the hardest thing the first time you do the hardest thing first as soon as you wake up and then everything else after that is easy yeah i saw on one of your stories that i don't know if it was with your brother or, with, or even other people in your team you were doing like a team circuit yeah yeah we do that every morning every the whole every team morning. uh about five six of us at the office no it's uh, it's just a gym locally oh nice but in our new office we want to get a gym in the i bet park. that's so good for team morale in the morning yeah so like I think just everyone buzzes off it and it gives everyone a purpose to wake up. It's not, let's mm. just get up and go to work. It's mm. let's get up, let's do something challenging and fun because it is fun. Let's have a chat about work, about what we need to get on with and let's go into the office and it's still half eight. Yeah. I, um, I, I've always been a big advocate for getting up early mm -hmm. and I, I hear what you're saying. Those hours where, no offense to my wife, my wife isn't up, my baby's not up. Yeah. No one's emailing me. There's no Slack messages. Mm -hmm. It's almost bliss to me. So I actually look forward to getting up early now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that a lot of people, you say five, people will hear this and go 5 a.m. and be like, what? Like, I'm not doing that. Yeah, but I go to bed at exactly. 8, 20, 8, 30. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You have the same amount of sleep as everybody else. That's it. It's by the time you get to eight, you're knackered. Yeah, it's just different. Now. Like I will be shattered at like seven, eight o'clock tonight. Yeah. And like, because I used to be a night owl. So like I've had both, both sides and, I used to stay up till four or five o'clock in the morning doing work. But then like, I watched my brother get up early and he would leave the office at like five, six. And I'd be like, how's he doing that? Like, how is he not working? But I was getting into the office at like 10, 11 o'clock in the morning because I was so tired. So like, people are different and you got to do what suits you. But what I've found has just helped me is getting up early, even though I did say to everyone, I was a night owl. I'm not at all anymore. Like, get me in bed for nine o'clock. How does that... Because a lot of social media and stuff, a lot of like, you know, in, I've heard a lot of your socials about how much you engage with your audience. Yeah. A lot of people are on socials in the evening. So how do you stop yourself from getting on your phone in the evening? Yeah, that's a good point. So like a hundred percent, I used to, like, I, I would say I still am addicted to my phone a hundred percent, but I think like the majority of the population is because everywhere you look, everyone's on the phone, but something I've been consciously doing and since the turn of the year and it's helped me massively is like. I just leave my phone downstairs when I go to bed. So I go to bed for half eight, nine. I leave my phone downstairs. I take my book up. I read. I have an alarm clock now. So I bought an alarm clock. So I didn't have to bring my phone up to, for the alarm. Cause let's be honest, you still use it as, a, as like checking through social media yeah. as soon as you wake up and then wake up, read, go downstairs. And then I'll check my phone after doing all the reading for an hour. And like, there's nothing that you're going to consume at nighttime before bed or in the morning that is going to like miraculously change your life. So no. what is the point of you consuming it? It just causes stress. It oh, just causes like The angst. amount of times that I've accidentally gone on like LinkedIn yeah. or Instagram and seen something that a competitor's doing and yeah. I'm like, we need to do that. Yeah, and, yeah. and wife, then it gets your brain ticking. My wife's like, you should go to sleep. Yeah. Stop scrolling. But I'm, it's, it is hard because especially, and I'm sure you're the same, if I work in social media, it's kind of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it isn't that's just, what you tell yourself, though. Yeah. Like, like, let's be honest. Mm. You could avoid it, and yeah. you could just pick it up the next day. Yeah, yeah. Like no. that, that's something I've learned over the past year. Like, nothing is so important that you need to know right now. No, so true. One of the things that I wanted to start, and I'm starting 
with so many of our guests is taking it right back to your background mm -hmm. because I think that that shapes who you are as a person today. Okay. So I know you work with your brother. I know that it's a very family oriented business. Talk to me about what your upbringing was like, what your family was like, mm -hmm. you know, where this drive to be who you are today is coming from. Yeah. So I grew up in like a very rich area. Mm. So like there's Liverpool and then just outside Liverpool, there's a place called Formby. And like all the footballers go to live there, whatever. Right. Like it's a very rich area. And like w when you tell people you're from Formby, people from Liverpool, they're like, oh, posh. Just assume that you're rich. Yeah, 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 for yeah. sure. Um, but we didn't like, we didn't come from money. Like my mum and dad want us to grow us up there because they wanted us to have the best upbringing possible. But like it, we just, we never like just got by, like we weren't poor or anything, but we never, like all the kids we were around constantly got what they wanted. They would have the latest clothes, latest shoes, and it would all be designer. And we'd be like, what the fuck? Like, but we had, there's four kids. So there's me, my sister, and then two brothers. And you're the youngest, right? I'm the youngest, yeah. yeah. So I'm 22, the oldest is 30. God, I feel so old. <laughs> 31 maybe. But yeah, very close family. Like obviously arguments and that growing up, yeah. but like that's just life. And then, but like very, very close. Um, we're still close now, like see each other most pretty much every weekend. But um, yeah, like in school, didn't really like school. I was always trying to do stuff to make money. So I'd be doing car boot sales on like my nan and granddad's front like lawn. So you were that typical kid, like entrepreneur kid. Yeah, selling but like, stuff like when I was young, I never thought, oh, I'm going to go into business. I just thought yeah. I want money. <laughs> yeah. like, I just want a bit of money so I can buy yeah. some sweets from the corner shop. Do you think that's because you were around richer kids yeah for sure like yeah. definitely i'll, I'll be because I, I remember coming up with an idea with my mom and dad like i remember them this just stuck in my head like i remember them having a conversation about money saying like they were short on it needed and i was like we can make videos for um you've been framed because they pay 250 quid per video <laughs> and i and like just like little things like that i would always be coming up with ideas of yeah. how to make just a little bit of money just because i didn't have the access to money as a kid mm. I'm, I'm i'm the exact same so i I grew up in a place we were talking before this called Livham. Um, and in that area, you've got rich and, and mm -hmm. not poor, but just not as well off. And I went to one of the state schools and then I played rugby and I got into a private school. So all of my friends had money. But yeah, yeah, I yeah. didn't have money. Yeah. So I've always had that, I don't call it a chip on my shoulder, just that motivation to always try and be as good as them. Yeah. So it's very similar to kind of how you grew up. I would say as a kid, you could even call it jealousy because you don't yeah. you don't understand that jealousy is a bad trait when you're so, so young, when you're 12, 13, 14, mm. you just think, you just see someone you're growing up with being and you not having it and you being like, I want that. But obviously mm. as you get older, you understand it a bit more. And like, but as a kid, I would definitely say I was a jealous person mm. and that that's just being completely transparent. But obviously I've learned through it and like understood that like, they just got that from their parents. They're not going to get it forever. Mm. Kind of like, yeah, jealous. jealousy is a bad trait to have, but definitely I had it as a kid. Yeah. And what did you do after school? You didn't go to university? Did no, you? so I was doing my business whilst I was in sixth form. Oh, wow. Oh, it was that young? I'd started at 17, oh, yeah. wow. Okay. Um, so I started at 17. I was missing lessons because I was delivering shoes all over Liverpool. What were your teachers saying? I didn't really tell them. So it was only a few of my close mates who knew I was doing it. Yeah. And because I wasn't making videos at the time, it was it was faceless. The business was faceless. Yeah. So it was only like, and I'd take a few of my friends with me in the car to drive, like just miss lessons just because like sixth form was horrendous. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I started at 17. As soon as I left school, I got a job because it wasn't full time. It was still on the side. Mm. I got a job for a month. I got let go because I was just disruptive in the office after like six weeks. Yeah. And then I was like, right, I've got a job offer in London with the civil service or I can take what I'm doing full time. And I sat with my brother and my dad and they were like, if it doesn't work, then you can go that, do yeah, that job you're eventually. still so young. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was 18 at the time. They yeah. were like, if this doesn't work, you can still do that job. Like at the end of the day, the worst thing possible that will happen to you is that you do what 99% of other people do yeah. and that's get a job. I was like, yeah, fair enough, makes sense. I'll, I'll go and just try my business. And then we opened up an external office space, which was three meters by three meters. Yeah. And that was where Lux Collective basically started as a proper business, as a still a side hustle for like a year on, on, but that was like quite a big step. I was talking to someone, um, one of the creators that was on the podcast the other day, and he was saying that he used to work at Barclays and he, he quit to go full-time content creator. I was like, what did your parents say? Yeah. Because like you've studied all your life, you've gone to university, you've 
gone and worked at Barclays and then you've quit to yeah. become a content creator. They must have been like, what the fuck? Yeah, I think it depends who your parents are, isn't it? Like my yeah. parents are like super supportive. Yeah. And especially being so young, they yeah. were like, what's the worst that can happen? Well, that, that's what he said. He said the one thing that they said was most people after their grad scheme, yeah. well, some of them will go and do a gap year again. They were like, this is basically your gap year. Mm. Go for it. But I think with that, with the pressure, it's like you've got a year to make it work. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So it's like mm. if you're marketing it to your parents as a gap year, they're like, you best have it sorted out yeah. by a year. Whereas for me, it was just liberating because like I had no weight on my shoulders. I had no bills to pay. I had nothing. So I was so lucky in that, in that sense. Mm. Um, but yeah, like it just worked out. Just worked out. Mm. And... How did it come about that you started working with your brother? Yeah, so me and Joe like weren't actually that close. We shared a bedroom really? for years. Yeah. So I did a video on TikTok and people like, I was like, oh, um, in the spare bedroom. And they're like, what, you had a spare bedroom? And I was like, well, if, the story is my older brother moved out and we used his bedroom, mm. which turned into the spare bedroom. But right. me, and, me and Joe shared a bedroom for like 10 years. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, I was top bunk, he was bottom. Um, what? And you were the, the younger brother? I'm the youngest. And you got top bunk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did that happen? Because the bottom bunk was a double bed. Oh, is that the, the better bunk? bunk? Was a I thought the top bunk would be the better Nah, bunk. the nah. top bunk's horrendous. You have to climb the ladders. Oh, of course. Time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, fair. Yeah, top get bunk's you. horrendous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so shared that for like 10 years until he went off to uni. Mm. And then... When he came back, that was really when our relationship started to grow. Mm. Like I was a bit more mature, like all my brothers made to say now, or like a few years ago when I used to go out with them a bit more than I do now. They were like, as a, as a kid, I used, to, I used to think you were so annoying. And I was like, fair, yeah. <laughs> I was, I probably was. <laughs> um, but yeah, like we got close when he came back from uni. And then he was always entrepreneurial as a kid. Yeah. In uni, he was selling boxes. He was selling caps, candles. He was doing everything. And I would be like, what's he selling? And then it, he'll stop selling it. And I'll be like, okay, I'll sell that now. Mm. So like, I just took over what he was selling. And then it just made sense to do it with him. Like he didn't have a secure job after uni. It, it was like, we're very, too, we're both very ambitious kids. Re like reach for the stars, think we can do anything very competitive. Mm. Like, and I just knocked on his door and I was like, do you want to start this and literally in like two seconds he was like yeah let's do it that was it literally it it's uh i mentioned before this that my wife and i started so i started outreach so i understand what it's like to work with a family member what do you think the hardest thing about it is this is what i was going to get on to is that in the it's not been as hard since we understood what our lanes were mm -hmm. when we first started we both wanted to do every aspect of the business we mm -hmm. both wanted to do like the operational side and the fun side yeah. let's call it or you know my wife's very good at networking and being personable and i'm a lot better at numbers and operations yeah but just to just to make a point on that yeah operations can be fun as well yeah yeah like fun is subjective yeah it? but i get what you mean like the yeah. creative side the, the creative yeah, exactly yeah. the creative side and it wasn't until we kind of were like right that's your lane mm. and this is my lane yeah and we're both amazing at our own lanes yeah and we're both kind of good at each other's lanes but like you do you i'll do me yeah then it was so much easier but in terms of the best thing for me about working with my with my wife is that just wholeheartedly trust one another. Mm. And we know that we'll always have each other's back. Even if we're both wrong, mm. I know that I'll have Amy's back. She, I know that she has mine. Yeah. The hardest thing is there are aspects where you, you can't be as blunt or honest with your loved one mm. that you can with someone in the business. Like I don't have that connect. There are aspects where I can be more blunt with, with, with Amy. Yeah. There are other aspects where I just can't, I can't have that conversation because it's my wife. I get that. But, from my perspective. Yeah, what's your pros and cons? Like, me and Joe, like, just get each other so much. Yeah, yeah. Like, we could tell anything to, en like, even like the other day, I was in London and I rung him up and I was like, we need to work on that. You need to do this. Mm. Like, basically, because like, I'm a very erratic guy. Yeah. And Joe is just not. But it, so it, when you were saying that, like, you can't say stuff blunt to her. I can say stuff blunt to him. You can say stuff blunt to me. Mm. And he just knows how to deal with me. Yeah. Cause like he probably got off the call when I said that and was like, 
he's just having a moment. I'll let him calm yeah. down. But like, if it was yeah. anyone else, if it was a friend, they would take it personally. And yeah, yeah. Like, we just don't take stuff personally. Yeah. And we, we have also now in the past 18 months, got a third person involved with us who went to a person who he's called Oliver. He went to school with Joe. Right. And like, he's like a third brother. Uh, he's helps. like we li- we spend ninety nine percent of time with each other, even on weekends. Yeah, like he is just so sick. What's the What's the biggest con though of working with yeah. Joe? <sighs> like, you can't say there's no. Nah, no. I know, I know, I know what you're saying, but like genuinely, yeah. genuinely, I can't say one thing that annoys me about Joe and working yeah. with him, and like a con of like a drawback of the business. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh no, it's it's obviously been a wholehearted positive. Maybe like maybe like. It slightly different ambitions so slightly different mm. directions and obviously if you go off one degree from the main ambition it can take you in a completely different destination yeah but overall like not a lot and it, and if anything it's my insecurities and my yeah wantingness of like being so stubborn that mm. is gonna like the other day we had an argument about carpet because i wanted carpet in a new studio he was saying we're moving off so soon there's no point but then like two minutes later he was like like he, he was cooking, he was cooking my tea for me. Well, his girlfriend was cooking my tea for me at the same time, and it was like moved on to the next thing. Yeah, like it's just there's just not anything bad I can say about. I, my I heard your um, one of your talks the other day. I was watching it on YouTube, and you were talking about how you just don't understand how people run businesses on their own. You are and like you need a partner. Oh, like I was on the phone to someone yesterday, and he wants me to go on this podcast, and he was saying about how he was having troubles doing this. He was struggling a bit, and I was just saying. Like, just get a partner. Yeah. It would just make your life so yeah. much easier. Like, obviously, that's my default answer because I have one, you have one, you yeah. probably do the same. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I'm trying to do this, 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 and this. And, and I was like, just get someone else in. But I never set out to have a partner. It's just, I, it's so funny. Like, I went through university in business school and yeah. I, in my head, I was like scouting people. At business. Yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. you're, you're going to be a business partner. Yeah. You're going to be a business partner one day. And then Amy and I just fell into mm. it and I almost found my perfect business partner yeah and kind of similar to you you've kind of like fallen into having the perfect person yeah like lunch collective would not be where it is if it was just me yeah one million percent when you say that sometimes you want to maybe go slightly in a different direction yeah how do you to get back on track in terms of like going in the same direction just honesty yeah having that honest conversation being blunt yeah just saying how you feel yeah and then like not coming to a compromise because you should never come to a compromise because if you do come to a compromise then you're both losing so, but like coming to an agreement where it's a win-win. I love that. So tell me about Lux Collective then. And for anyone that, that is listening or watching that doesn't understand kind of your yeah. business model. One, talk to me about the business model when you first started. Yeah. Comparatively to how it is now. It's pretty, pretty similar. Pretty much the same. Yeah. So basically, we buy unwanted luxury items. Mm. Uh, people will fill out a form on our website. We'll give them a quote. We're, um, if they accept it, we'll send them a free shipping label. They'll send it in. We check it, condition, authentication. If it passes those checks, we send the money the same day. Mm. That is pretty much it. And then we, we, after that process of buying it, we clean it to as brand new as possible. And then we photograph it for our website, put it on our website, and then sell it. How did the idea come about? So, like Liverpool, if you know it as a fashion-based city at all, it's like very trend trendy, like... The style is sick, but like, it's very much everyone wears the same stuff at once because that's in trend. Mm. Um, and you won't see it anywhere else in the UK. It's like, that's Liverpool style for now. And then it will change, it will evolve. But like, you look at someone and you could spot a scouser from miles away. Like when I come to London, I'm like, yeah, definitely, Liverpool, definitely. <laughs> but um, like in Liverpool at one time, there was loads of people just selling their old stuff on Instagram because Instagram was like just so easy to upload something and just sell it. So we'll DM you saying, yeah, I want that. Mm. And I looked at it and I was like, yeah, it's, it's really easy to sell and the market's there. But like, there's just so many people doing it. And I was thinking, I want to start a business. I want to do, that looks fun, but I can't do menswear because it's so saturated. I just start with women's wear. And like, people would have thought women's wear was more saturated, but for the market we were aiming for, which was the Gen Z's before, like Gen Z was a term really, because it was like five years ago and it wasn't widely used. Like we were aiming at that. We were aiming at, if me and Joe were girls, what would we want to buy? Mm. And it would be like the trendy sneakers, mm. the um, little, at the start we didn't even do bags. It took us like two years to get into bags, but like coats with fair hoods, Canada Gooses, Montclair's, like everything we would want at that age, we were doing it. And like, we were really clever of getting into that bag market and that, 
higher tier luxury through footwear. Like no one's done it how we've done it. Like we targeted footwear, went so niche on footwear and then introduced bags. And like, we wouldn't have been able to be where we are with Lux Collective now if we would have gone straight into bags because we wouldn't have been able to capture that Gen Z audience mm. when we first started. When you first, because I was listening to more stuff that you were talking about on your socials and it, you were saying that it took you a couple of years to get it going and you were like mm. having doubts about whether or not this was a mistake or the right thing. Like what was the biggest hurdle and what were, what were the biggest challenges in terms of it just not working to begin with? So obviously, so we, we have, we've had no investment still from when we started to this point now. We've had no investment and we started with 1200 quid. Mm. So Joe had a thousand pounds and I had 200. We were like, yep, that will do. But if you think about it, our inventory is expensive. Just going back to that, how, cause I know the answer to this, yeah. but how did you get that money? Cause it's a great story. Yeah. So we started with 1200 pounds. Joe was like, I want a new car. I want a BMW. So we took out 10,000 pounds. The car cost 9,000 pounds. So we had a thousand pounds left over. And then I was football refereeing at the time yeah. and I just had 200 quid saved up. <laughs> so I was like, I've got 200 quid. I know it's not a lot. It'll probably get us one piece or half a piece. I was going to say, what did you do with 1200 quid? Literally, someone asked us this the other day and I was like, we have just bought and sold until we are where we are now. Wow. We've literally just... Just flipped and yeah, flipped, li and flipped. flipped and flipped and flipped and flipped. Yeah. Like we would, our first pair of shoes, just like a pair of Isabel Morant Beckett's. Mm. They were cost us like 140. We sold them for 160, 20 quid profit. Okay, let's go, let's go. Literally that for the first two years, it was just that. That's insane. And like, we never took a penny out. But I think when people say, oh, I never took a penny out my business, like that's just standard. If you want to get anywhere in, in, in business, yeah. like you can't take any money out unless you just start up with an investment. Mm. And then what was that big, what was that hurdle then? Like between for the first two years, not really getting to where you want it to be. Yeah. What was that hurdle? And then how did you get over it? I would say the main hurdle when we started with like little money was the fear of someone coming in with a lot of money and doing it. But I think like you can give away and like show people your business model as much as you want and tell people how to do it. And like 99% of people won't do it. And like when we first started, it was like breaking the stigma of pre-owned stuff. Like when we first started Lux Collective, everyone thought secondhand stuff was dirty, disgusting. Mm. Don't want to wear it. Someone else has touched it. We, we got messages being like, don't tell anyone I bought from you. Like it was that stigma. Like now it's cool to yeah, wear yeah, pre-owned. But yeah. when we first started and it wasn't even that long ago, it was like four, four years ago. Oh, mate, I remember being a, a teenager and if I'd have bought something that was pre-loved, you would have, so people would have taken the piss. Yeah, like one million yeah, yeah. percent. Like we were getting messages saying, don't tell people I bought from so you. So do you think that the, the the rise has obviously been because of a lot of hard work and we'll go on to the social media side of things yeah. in a bit, but do you also think it's a market and an acceptance of pre-loved or do you think that you've created an environment yeah. that it's cool to have pre-loved? I feel like from an ego point of view, yeah. me and Joe have broken down that stigma. I 100% think that you've had a huge, huge... I think we have. Like I genuinely... Like, yeah. And like Impact we've had it. a... It's a huge impact, but we've had a tiny impact on culture because mm -hmm. of it. Like we've made that culture cool yeah. from the videos we do. Obviously we'll get onto that in a sec, but mm -hmm. we we actually made it acceptable for the, for a lot of people to think it was okay to buy pre-loved, which it is. Mm -hmm. I was wearing pre-loved when I was a kid. Like yeah. I would be taking stuff off my friends, like wearing yeah. it, like it is okay. But like, like it's crazy to think when we first started the amount of people who like we used to reach out to influencers and be like oh yeah and they'd be like yeah i love your products and then we'd explain that it's pre-owned and they'd be like oh no i don't want to do it there's a one massive influencer as well that like i proper wanted at the time yeah but like now you gotta tell me who that is after <laughs> one of one of the things before we get on socials that i really want to talk to you about is um and i don't want to keep banging on about it because oh, it makes go. me feel old but <laughs> you're incredibly young yeah incredibly young mm -hmm. for being so successful and i have somewhat some some knowledge of this because i was never as successful as you were at 22 but at 23 i started managing a, a huge youtuber and i was in meetings with the heads of youtube the heads of spotify and i was walking in at 23 and i saw the moment i walked in they were like mm. who is this <laughs> so i've been through that stage of trying to have respect yeah. with older individuals do you feel like they disrespect you i feel like i had to really prove myself a lot quicker what do you feel now well now being 28 and having a business that's yeah. doing well yeah it's a lot easier even now 
to be fair, actually, in this industry, I'm, I'm actually quite old. The other owners oh, really? of other talent agencies are either my age or younger, a yeah. lot of them. There's there's talent agencies like the YMUs of the world where they've been going for 20 years. Yeah. But the newer agencies, a lot of people are my age and younger. So actually, I'm not that young anymore. Yeah. So right now, it's, it's, it's not an issue. But I distinctly remember back in the day having to hold my own mm -hmm. and prove myself so much quicker than I... And maybe, again, maybe it was all in my head. Yeah. Maybe it was just a chip on my shoulder. And they weren't thinking that. Yeah. But how have you dealt with being so young in a competitive industry and walking in, whether it's into suppliers or, you know, I don't know who you might be talking to in terms of your business, but how have you dealt with that? Um, just having the huge confidence that we are the best and yeah. you're lucky to be in a room with us. I love that. Like genuinely, like yeah. our business, our market is about to explode. In 2030, it's going to be worth something like 50x what it is now, which is fucking wild. Mm -hmm. I haven't got the exact figures. I think it's something like, it's either 80 billion or 800 billion. I don't know which one it is, but it's eight, it's eight zero something. Yeah. So like, we're, like, we know we're in a good place. We know we're on the right trajectory. We're the best, like we are the best at what we do. Mm. Like, and we always, not always have been, but we we always known that the, 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 our plan and the steps that we take we're going to be the best because like packaging, we need to get that perfect. Um, pictures on the website need to get that perfect. Customer experience needs to get that perfect. Like, and we work on it every single day. And like, we're at a stage now where we're like, we're a lot better than all our competitors. Mm. But to stop that complacency, we need to tell our team every single day, we are better, but to be the best, we need to be better every single day. We need to be yeah. better than yesterday. But like just having that confidence of we're the best, you're lucky to be in the room with us. We're basically giving you an opportunity here. Although like we might have asked for the meeting or like, like whatever, like it's actually, if you, if we do something together, we're going to be able to produce something that we're both going to remember for the rest of our mm. lives. Like yeah. we're, we're like, we're so excited about what's going to happen. Well, that resonates so much. Our, our business strategy this year. And is... sorry. No, no, go ahead. The fact I have like, baggy eyes and a beard helps me look older as well because everyone says that so like i use that as a hook a lot on social media it's like so you can never a 22 change, a 22 year old business owner and everyone comments like what you're only 22 and like because i thought you, you look about 30 odds and i'm like whatever but it gets comments and it boosts the algorithm whatever but what I about when you that. weren't the best though what about when you were like we, we never know we never had we never like Businesses wouldn't touch us, they wouldn't yeah. want to know because we weren't the best. So we were like, oh, okay, to speak to these people, we have. Yeah. So, like Alex Hormozy, he talks about yeah. like people, like people will only listen to you if you've got evidence to back it up. Yeah. So, we, me and Joe literally looked at each other and we were like, okay, if we want to be working with these brands, if we want to be the best, if we want to do this, this, and this, we have to genuinely do that and be it. Mm. So, like, we, we are so focused every single day and have been for the past 18 months, two years, f even two and a half years of what we're producing. We're so obsessed and so focused in our own lane. We don't give like a flying fuck about what anyone else is doing. We are so focused. Uh, it's so funny because I asked um, Amy's dad about this the other day because he, he's been quite successful in business. And I said to him, how do you deal with not comparing yourself to your competitors? Because mm. I find myself quite often, maybe not comparing myself, but just looking, you know, what yeah, they're yeah. doing. Because you, you do, right? Yeah. And he said, I, I didn't give a fuck about what my competitors were doing. Yeah. I was so focused. And to be fair, he was in an age where there was no social media. He didn't uh, know what his competitors were doing. Yeah. But it, now you can see instantly what yeah, they're yeah. doing. And he just said, I don't care. Uh -huh. I just focused exactly on what I was doing, what my team was doing. And yeah. that's all that mattered. And if it worked, it worked. If it didn't, then it's on me. But like, answer this question. Why does it matter what anyone yeah. else is doing? Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't. It doesn't. I think there's a, there, there's a thing in a lot of business and just people in general where they've got like quite a famine mentality that yeah. it's either I have it or you have it. No, it's abundant. When, when it's abundant. And like you said, the growth in your market or even in the market I'm in is going to be so exponential over the next few years. Mm -hmm. There's room for everybody in it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you asked me before the, um, the podcast, like what was interesting about getting you on is I don't know a lot about luxury items yeah. at all. I've got a few okay trainers. I've got a watch that was given to me for my wedding. Mm. Bar that. And my brother-in-law will make fun of me because he says that I always wear labeled or branded stuff, but it's not expensive branded stuff. I'm talking like All Saints and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. But one thing that really interests me about your videos and something that 
I just I, why I love watching them is because it's not flashy. I see a lot of people making money. I see people around me making money. And the first thing they're doing is they're dropping thousands of pounds on a brand new Rolex or they're going out to Dubai and hiring them a Lamborghini. And I hate that stuff. Uh-huh. It's not me. I love that you're coming at it from a pre-love sustainable mindset. So talk to me about that a little bit. We want we want to be the biggest pre-love retailer in the world. Mm. We can't do what everyone else is doing because they're not the biggest pre-love retailer in the world. Mm. The one that is, is like been doing it for 25 years. Like we need to come, if we want to take over them, we need to come. At, uh, Who's that? Uh, they're called Fashion Fire, but like, it's not even like I want to take over them because we look at their business and think you're the best. Mm. I'm just going to steal like an artist everything you do. Mm. I, I'm going to take inspiration. Like they're a massive inspiration. It's not like they're not even in the UK. They're in the US. They're massive. Um, but they don't sell. They, they don't like have anything in the UK, which is wild. But like, it's not that like I want to overtake them, but like, I just want to be the best. Anything I do, I want to be the best. So like, how can I do that? Look at the best, take from them and then put my spin on it. Mm. So like with the content, it was always like, people aren't bothered about like a Chanel bag. Like at the end of the day, they're not bothered about a Chanel bag. Like a small percent are probably like our, our audience, probably 1%. But like, they just want to get value. Like people just want to come away from a video thinking I've learned something or I've been entertained or that's made me laugh. So like, how can we do that? It's just providing value. And it's like, give, 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 give. And then eventually you'll get. Yeah. Like I don't see, like as soon as we started going on TikTok, the first 10 videos, I was like, okay, this is not an app for selling. This is an app that we can build brand awareness on. I never knew how much brand awareness we would build on it. And it's been fucking wild how much we have, but I just knew that we couldn't sell our products on there. So I was like, okay, let's just, let's just educate people on here. And that's mm. basically what we did. And it's evolved as we, from the moment we started, but the fundamentals of giving value and getting the viewer to come away with something yeah. is still there. Was it weird for you the first time you put your face on a video? And post so it? like, there's a story where like I was scared to put myself on social media, mm. but now we have over 1.5 million followers. But the reason I was so scared was because I put a video on Instagram of a real versus fake, but I never had my face. It was just a voiceover. Mm. And then I put it on Instagram and I was like, we need to be doing videos like this. This was like 2018, 2019. I was like, we need to be doing videos like this. And then I was in a group chat with like friendship group I was in at the time. And it got sent into that group chat and they were all taking the piss out of it. And I was thinking, oh my God, I'm either going to have to, if I don't want this to happen about people chatting shit about me or people taking the piss out of me, I either have to do one or two things. And that's not post video content on social media or not surround myself with people like this. And if you want to grow a business, what's the obvious answer there? Yeah. So I was like, okay, I'll drop them as friends and let's just focus on the videos. So like that kind of like hammer, hammering me down and knocking me down made me pursue it even more wow, because obviously yeah. I was telling you yeah. we're competitive people. Yeah. And if someone says I can't do something. You want to do it. I want to do yeah, it. Yeah. So like them taking the piss out of me was the biggest blessing I've ever had because I was yeah. like, and that was when we had not even a TikTok account. Mm. We had... 11,000 followers on Instagram. Like we grew yeah. through competitions back in the day. I looked at that and I was like, okay, Zan, let, let, let's have it. I'll, I'll try and do it. And yeah. I love it. It's like a big fuck you to them. Yeah, kind of. But like, again, what we said earlier is like, why does it matter what other people are doing? Like, no. couldn't care less. Like, What was it like in terms of, I guess, there seems to have been an arc rise for, for looks with the arc rise of TikTok. Uh-huh. What's TikTok done for your business? Yeah, like that's the main reason why we are where we are today. Mm. Um, like TikTok's the main reason, but also like the work that we've done for TikTok in terms yeah. of like when I first started, I posted for the first two years, three to five times a day for two years. Like every single day, wouldn't miss a day. It was locked down. I was like, what else am I going to do? I'm going to get up. I'm going to do three videos. And if I don't do these three videos, I can't do anything. So I was like, I need to make three videos and then I can do like relaxing things yeah. or like other things. And like, I just got the book for it. Like I got so excited to make these videos. I got so excited to reply to people on comments. I got so excited to like edit, like improve my editing skills. And um, yeah, over the years we've kind of dialed down on quantity because we've tried to improve quality, but then quality is subjective, but just like production value, but also information value. But the other thing that's hard is that that type of content I would argue is 
for example, some of the creators on our roster do like comedy skits. Mm. That takes ages to film. Yeah, yeah. It takes ages to edit. You can't be posting three or four a day. I would disagree. <laughs> I'd say if you're signing up to do that, yeah. if you're signing up to be a comedian, if yeah. you're signing up to telling everyone you're going to be the biggest comedian, you you, you want all this awareness. Yeah. All right, well then do three scripts a day. Yeah, it's going to take long, but if you want yeah. it that bad, you're going to do it. Well, you've heard it here first, everybody on our roster. You better start fucking putting out three a like, day. I swear that, like, there's, there's like, I'm, I'm sitting up for this because I'm so like, this is like a huge opportunity we've yeah. got as like a society yeah, in business yeah. if you want to build brand awareness. Yeah. Why the fuck aren't you posting three pieces of content a day mm. saying you're going to be the biggest in your business, in your industry? Yeah. Why aren't you doing it? Because you don't have time. I, I think that's a lie. And, you, mm. and m maybe you go home and you're very busy doing what else? Well, you just don't want it hot. You just don't want it yeah. enough. Yeah. Like swear to God, you just don't want it enough. Yeah. Like, I'm so passionate about that because like you it's like mo it's moaning about something and then not putting in the work to do it and like we get it all the time mm. and like like if you want it that bad you would do it I was speaking to somebody yesterday about this and he was saying that okay you, you say you don't have time but then you're watching two hours of Netflix yeah, a day. Yeah, yeah. you're you're saying you can't w wake up early or you don't want to wake up early yeah, but yeah, you could yeah. you could buy yourself back three or four hours if you just have a bit less sleep yeah yeah well life is choices in it and yeah, you, yeah. you 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 your success is based on the choices you make. Yeah. Just taking it back, sorry, quickly about sustainability. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize how much, I, I knew that the fast fashion brands were causing waste. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize to what extent. It's To be fair waste. though, it's not just fast fashion. Like it's fashion as an industry. Mm -hmm. Like it's the second biggest polluter after travel. So mm -hmm. like your cargo ships, your plane, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Like it's the second biggest polluter just because like how much energy it it takes to make it and like yeah. the waste of it all yeah. and like the burning of it if you waste it and like in landfill yeah like it's humongous yeah and how's pre pre-loved or you know pre-owned stuff helping that like what is have they started to do the research into it in terms of how big an effect it would have if people move towards that pre-loved movement because you know i've seen the ebays of the world really pushing this kind of thing in their brand messaging uh-huh how is it helping yeah well i don't know the exact figures but like like massively like it's yeah the pre-loved industry is going to be bigger than the fast fashion industry in the next five years mm. fast fashion industry done for yeah done for there was a company that sold the other day for 1.2 million and two years ago they were valued at 102. who was that in the style really sold for 1.2 mil i saw one of your videos the other day talking about sheen we've worked with them in terms of brand deals i didn't realize how many products they produce yeah, like, so Shein's a mad one. Like the business model's crazy. So like it's basically like an Amazon for fast fashion. Mm. Um, yeah, it's disgusting to be fair. Um, but like, yeah, like it's it's helping and like with the Gen Z and millennials, it's, it's sustainability is in the three things that they subconsciously think of before they make a purchase. Mm. So like, it's an important thing to have in your business. Like our business model naturally is sustainable. Mm. We don't push our sustainability message anywhere near as much as we could do. Mm. Like we plant a tree for every order that's placed on the website. No Why don't you think you push it enough? Just because we, we, we're too busy with other stuff. <laughs> yeah. Like we've got about four different brand deals going on at the moment. We've got about two different apps that we're working on, trying to put onto our website. Mm. Like we've got, like I said to you, I'm, I'm down in London most weeks just yeah. with meetings. Yeah. Like, I'm filming 30 to 50 pieces of content a month. Mm. I'm coming on podcasts. I'm trying to build my personal <laughs> yeah. brands. Like yeah. we don't feel like we need to push that message. Like if we know we're doing it as a company, we don't need to tell everyone. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's another selling point for the future, but we don't want to like greenwash and we don't want to be like, mm. oh, buy, buy for us, like make our customers feel bad. Like buy with us and you'll plant a tree and help the environment. It's like, no, like, we're doing all this stuff in the background, planting trees, recyclable packaging, all this type of stuff. Yeah, actions speak louder than words. Yeah, right? of course. And like, if we ever need to do it in the future or we ever feel like it would be a good message to push, yeah. then we can do. But like, yeah, it's just something, like exactly how you said, actions speak louder than words. It's, um, you're saying how busy you are, but you can only be that busy if you build a team around oh, you. Yeah. What was that like going from just you and your brother yeah. to hiring, firing, yeah. trusting people to be as motivated as you are, which is never going to happen. Yeah. What was that like? So two years ago, 
it was just me and Joe. Yeah. A year ago, there was seven of us. Mm. And now there's 20. Soon to be 24. And um, by the end of May, probably. Um, it's the best part of a business. Like when I was with, when it was just me and Joe, I was like, I can't wait to, until we hire a team. We're going to have this, this, and this, and this. And I thought that was like six, seven, eight years away, not a year, two years mm -hmm. away. And I swear to God, I was telling this to uh, my team on, because like we were driving to a meeting, there was four of us in the car. Mm. And I was like to them the other day, but yesterday, I was like, we are so good. Mm. Like our team is amazing. Like, honestly, like I'm, I'm not envious, but like, I feel sorry for other companies because our team is so good. Mm. Like honestly, every person in our team is amazing at what they do. Yeah. And like, everyone loves coming in. Everyone has some sort of friendship with each other. Mm. It's like, I'm so proud of what I've built in that aspect. Has, like, that, been, has that been an easy process to build? No. Or have you had to go through the process of hiring the wrong people yeah, to get of course, the right people. but like that's life in it like yeah, yeah. you only know like we've hired for roles that after two months it shouldn't have been a role we hired for so we've had to say to the person i'm sorry it's our fault just take accountability i'm really sorry it's our fault it's not gonna work mm. i wish you the best yeah like that might sound a bit savage but it's like i've got i'm like i'm like i'm just learning as as, yeah, as yeah. everyone else is yeah so like yeah maybe but like sorry like it yeah. but like like, sorry, like what else can you do? Like you just learn from it. Like you said, it's just le like lessons. There's no point in me looking back, feeling bad about that or mm. doing whatever, because like, there's nothing I can do. Mm. Like it's happened. Do you know what I mean? How do you cultivate that culture in terms of your business? And, and I guess getting people to come in and be part of that team. I think our TikTok helps massively. Like we've got a lot of Gen Zers and mm. millennials who work for us. Like the oldest person's 27. Mm. So we tw team of 20, the average age is probably 22. Yeah. So like, our team's really young. So obviously TikTok's really helped because they've seen us, we've got loads of followers, they want to be a part of it. But also actually realizing that what they see on TikTok or, or like the older videos we used to do where it was more so talking about team culture and like showing the culture, it's genuinely like that. Mm -hmm. It's not like we just put on a facade for for TikTok. Like everyone who comes in, like, like I swear to God, I genuinely, not almost cried, but like I was so proud of myself when this happened two days ago. We hired someone about a week ago and he come, like, we love him. He's so funny, like hilarious, sick to have around. And he was on his lunch downstairs and he was just laughing. And I was going, lad, what are you laughing at? <laughs> he was just laughing. It was, it was a bit mad to be fair. I was like, lad, what are you laughing at? And he went, I just never thought I'd find somewhere where I love coming in every day. Mm. And like, I was like, I looked at Joe and we were just like both nodding at each other, thinking like we knew what we were thinking. We were like, that is fucking so nice to hear. Yeah. Like that makes us feel so good. Mm. Like not like how much money have you made this week? How much how much money are you gonna make? How, what brands are you? Yeah. Like someone who's from Liverpool, who's seen the brand, followed us for two years, mm. absolutely buzzing to be a part of the brand. I love hearing this because I think it's taken me a couple of years to realize that it, not realize, I always knew that team was important, but realize what is important about the team. And it isn't all numbers and targets no, and nothing like that. It's about making it an environment where people, like you say, enjoy coming in. Yeah. And everyone wants to do their best. Art was going to say earlier, what art, the thing that resonated about you having the best in your industry uh -huh. and being the best in your industry is that our strategy for the whole year is to be the best in yeah, our industry, yeah. but in every little thing that we do. And someone commented in one of my videos going, well, how do you even measure that? Yeah. That's not the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The point is the mindset behind it. Yeah. Whether it's how you negotiate a contract, how you speak to a client, be the best at it. Mm. And I think that it's taken me, like we've had a similar growth in terms of our employee base. To be fair, about in July last year, we were a team of six and now we're a team of 20. So we've grown very quickly, but in that time, I've tried to focus on, I think sometimes on the wrong aspect of building a team. You always will do that. Yeah, because because you're learning, right? Yeah. And I think that what you're saying resonates so much because right now, all my focus is, is what is the mindset of my team? Yeah. And if I can get that right. Yeah, it's about building company focus and have, yeah. having everyone on the same page and striving towards that same goal. And like I said at the beginning, if you move, so like if you set off in San Francisco and you're heading to New York, but you're one degree off, mm. you end up in like 
uh, Montreal or something. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like yeah. in Canada, like, and that's yeah. one degree. That's one degree. That's like tiny. Yeah. How do you keep them all on the same page? Keeping people up to date with everything as c- constant as you can. So like we have a weekly, m- weekly team meeting and we're implementing weekly one-to-ones as well, just like five minutes. Mm. Like this is this is where you are. This is where we want you to get to. This is our goals as a company. This mm. is what we want you to do for us. What do you want to achieve? Okay, let's do that. Like, let's put that in there somewhere. And then we aim for it. And then we check back next week. I think training this has been something as well that has been huge for me. Yeah. Like focusing on that. So training, I'm not good at it. <laughs> Joe is amazing at it. See, there you go. That's why you need so a partner. 100%. Like, mm. We are literally yin and yang. Like he will mm. not put his face in. He will do, but like he doesn't. He doesn't have any yeah. motivation to put his face in front of a camera. Do like, you ever run around trying to fit video him? And nah, like, like look. we we like you said, we know our lanes. Yeah. And we stick to our lanes. Yeah. Like he's operations, finance, and people. Yeah. He's great with people. Yeah, uh, training wise, like it's like SOPs. Like he 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 sets the standards, and everyone everyone can do that stuff because Joe's not talented at mm. cleaning shoes, mm. at checking a bag, at um, data entry. He's not talented at that. Like, do you know what I mean? He's just, he's just worked hard and done, knows how to do it. Mm. Teaches you how to do it. Mm. Cause it's so he knows anyone can do it. So like he, he, he is so good at training. Talking of training and like educating, do you feel now because you're, let's call it the best yeah. at what you do on TikTok? Yes. Yeah. Do you now feel a responsibility to people who are your audience watching you to educate them constantly on this market? Yeah, so like our aim for TikTok is like, I want to get it up on the wall. Mm. It's like we have we have the responsibility, exactly how you said, we have the responsibility to give this audience this, 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 and this, which is education, entertainment, mm. um, and news. Yeah. We have we have the responsibility to do that. We need to give, it's not about what we're gonna get from it. Not we're aiming to get this ma- amount of views, we're aiming to get this amount of comments. It's like, we aim to give you education. We aim to give you as much value as we possibly can. Mm. And if that's what your aim is, then your return is gonna multiply. You almost can't fail. No, you can't yeah. because like, if you're if you're like educating as much as you solely can possibly can, then that's your best. You've done yeah. your best. Yeah. Well done. Do you know what I mean? Like that's it, and that's what we aim to do. It's not so like yeah. I was reading a book on the way up here, and it, it it it's talking about like if you focus on giving value to your audience, that will naturally increase your revenue. But if you focus on increasing revenue, it will it won't multiply anywhere near as much is if you focused on your audience. Mm. And like my main focus is just my audience. I couldn't what, care What about less. within the business? Like, so you've got your social media side of the business, yeah. but in terms of the nuts and bolts of the business, yeah. how much do you focus on the numbers um, and, and the revenue and, and the, you know, your profit margins and things like that? Like, is that, or is that something that your brother does? Or uh, Yeah, so like profit margins, we don't look at, we just look at the end of the year reports and being like, okay, had a good year. Let's do the same. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like we put everything back into the business, like mm. in terms of like new equipment, new members, mm. like new team members, um, like just trying to, trying to improve every aspect of the business. Like we couldn't give a fuck how much profit we make at the end of the year. Mm. Obviously there'll be a stage we get to where we do, but we're not at that stage yeah, yet. Yeah, Cause like, you're just building something yeah, bigger, of than, bigger than the business. We're really. building something bigger than us. Yeah, yeah. We're building something bigger than anyone like, yeah. like can comprehend like, we, we just don't care. And that's why they do so well. It's like when you don't care, it's like when a girl's chasing a boy, like if you're chasing that girl, yeah. like, you, like it, 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 if, you, if you're chasing it so much, then you're probably not gonna get it. Mm. Whereas like, we're just so not bothered yeah. that like we, we get it. Are you dating anyone or you've got a girlfriend? No. No? No. Is that out of choice? Is it out of the fact that you work obviously so hard? like? So like, I just don't think I would be a good sub boyfriend to someone Why not? Moment because I'm just so focused and they just won't get any of my time. Okay. Um, like definitely like thought about it over the years and like, I'm just so, I'm just like, it's something I battle with like a I lot. I was gonna say, is that is uh, it something that annoys you? That's like my biggest. Or even not even, okay. So not even like romantic relationships, friendships. Like, do you feel like you like, drifted from friends because you've been so busy or? Yeah, 
yeah, drifted from friends from school, but like I've made friends through my business. Yeah. Like my brother is my best friend. Yeah, Ollie, yeah. who's in the company with us, is my like one of my best friends. Mm. Like, and we spend ninety nine percent of the time with each other. We're like minded people. We talk about the same things. We all exercise together. We all want to push ourselves. We're doing a half marathon next week. Like, we want to do the New York marathon. We we, we like like if I if I stuck around my friends from high school. I wouldn't be doing any of that. And that's not to say I don't like them. Mm -hmm. I love them all. But like just limiting your time with people is so essential because like it's that Jim Rohn saying, isn't it? Where it's like you are the average of the five most people you spend most time with. So if you spend time with five alcoholics, you'll be the sixth. If you spend time with five millionaires, you'll be the sixth. So it's just like pick pick who you spend the most time with. It's not to say you can't spend any time with them. It's just to say if you want to be a success and you're so driven to get to where you want, you need to surround yourself with the right people. What do you do when you have failure in your life, whether it's the business, personal life, your socials, they're just not where they want, you want them to be. Yeah. Because one of the big things that I want to focus on speaking to people is mindset, because I'm big on mindset. Yeah, for sure. How do you deal with failure? Do you go to your brother? Do you go to friends? Do yeah. you like go just do a crazy workout? Like, yeah. What is it that you do when you go to failure? I think, and I really want people to adapt this mindset, is that you can't fail if you take full responsibility for what happened. So if, if, if you send an order to the, we've done it loads where we've sent an order, 3000 pound bag to the wrong address, not got that back. Accept responsibility, just be like, okay, this is what happened. This is what we need to do in play, to put in place that it won't happen in the future. And you twist it and be like, that's never gonna happen again. So that's a success. Mm -hmm. It like genuinely, when you were asking me that, when you had when you have failure i genuinely do not see anything like and that this sounds less, like all lessons yeah, yeah, it, yeah like i genuinely do not see anything because what's the worst that can happen from doing something like lose the business okay you're gonna die no like do you know what i mean like it's that extreme yeah honestly we we say it in the team all the time because it's a stressful job we're in in terms of like you've got like clients expecting things from you you're constantly negotiating but we say it all the time is anybody gonna die if you, yeah, if you like fine. no like yeah. i was at a, um, a party a few weeks ago and this girl was there and she's a doctor mm. and i was telling her about my stressful day and then she pulled out that you know she's a doctor she had to tell a, a family member yeah. that um their kid had died yeah and i was like puts you your day in puts, perspective, you, puts everything in perspective yeah. and i think that's it's so true what a, gary v said yeah. sorry just to no, no, interrupt no. you before you go on to the next point gary yeah. v says it, it's like he wakes up every morning and imagines that um, he's had a phone call that his whole family have died in a car crash. Mm. And then the rest of the day, it's not nothing's going to be bad because he's already imagined the worst thing ever that can happen to him. And sometimes I do it in a weird way of like, think about the worst thing that would happen in my life now is Joe dying, mm. like my brother and business partner. Yeah, yeah. Like, like that is the w like most catastrophic thing that could ever happen to me like right now in my life. And it's like, if I think about that, just because he means so much to me, and if I think about that, mm. It's like, okay, he hasn't died today. It's all perspective. It's not belittling other people's stressful lives. It's no, just, it's sure. just saying, you know, put things into perspective. But what I was going to say is, you might be one of the most passionate people about your industry that I've ever come across. <laughs> like you really, like, I don't know if it's because you're from Liverpool and everybody's animated, but uh -huh. you're bloody passionate. <laughs> How important is passion to business? Yeah, I think like, what's the point if you're not passionate? Like, yeah. so like working 12, 13, 14, 15 hour days, if you're doing that and you're not passionate about something like you are well, going to burn out. I don't think you're going to do it, are you? No, you are going to burn yeah. out. Like, it, like, it's like, if I was told, all right, Ben, you have to do 12 to 15 hours of influencer outreach, what you do, mm. I'd be like, fuck that. <laughs> but just because yeah. that's not what I'm into, yeah, you yeah. might be into like, and vice versa, if I was to tell you, you had to do what I did for no. 15 hours a day, you'd be like, fuck that. I think the, the thing that's interesting when you say that is like, and I love influence marketing, but I don't love it to the extent that you love what you do. What I love is business. Yeah, I love the game of business. Yeah, so yeah, I was yeah. telling you before this, I used to play sport, not yeah. to a high level, but I used to love sport. Yeah, and yeah. the reason why I loved it is because it was competitive. Yeah, anything yeah. I do, I, I want to win at it. And that's why I love anything business related. So for me, I think that passion is important as fuck 
to yeah, be yeah, yeah. to be good at business. I don't think that you need to be the like. I'm sure Gary V wasn't the most passionate about social media because he uh -huh. was passionate about wine. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. how he started. Yeah, right? okay, I get you. So, he, but he was passionate about. He says it all the time about the game mm. of business. So I think that. It, it's about finding your passion in the thing that you're doing mm. and not just because I think people go, oh, well, I don't really love anything, so I can't start a business. Yeah. That's not the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like go and do something and yeah. figure out what your passion is. Well, it's just like trying a hundred things until something sticks because exactly, like yeah. you're not going to go through your whole life and not enjoy anything. No. Do you know what I mean? Like you are going to find something that you do enjoy and that could be literally walking dogs. That's a mindset thing though. That's an, an, an opening yourself up to trying a hundred things. Yeah, it's just like, it's just being open-minded and like you said like not a closed book yeah like that was something i definitely was when i was in school mm. like i was very narrow-minded and like rejected everything and then as soon as you open yourself up you're like wow there's so much opportunity to do what you enjoy out there do you have any regrets in terms of the business um it's a nice place to be <laughs> no regret yeah i know but like like i said before it's like you look back like what's the what's the point in looking back mm. i wouldn't say i have any regrets at all probably like or any lessons i guess from uh things that you did in the beginning that you wish you could have changed nah like not uh, at all like it's because it's taught you everything yeah, yeah but like and that's like not in a woo woo way of being like oh like i've not failed i've not learned anything like i've learned so much like i try and learn every single second of the day yeah but like yeah, like no, no regrets or nothing that I, I would look back on and be like, oh, if it, if if that, because like if, if shouldn't be in your vocabulary, like if you, like, like yeah, just like if that, if this would have happened, like fuck that, like it's happened, like what can you do? Talk about that, because you've, you've mentioned a few times about reading books and learning. Where's yeah. this, where's this like thirst for continually, continuously improving and learning come from? Has that been something that you've always been like? No, so like this has only come on in the last two years. And I used to, uh, live with someone who has a business in Liverpool as well. Bennett's, it's like a sportswear brand. Oh yeah. Affiliate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was massive on learning. And when I first became mates for him about two years ago, I was like, why does this kid like read so much? And why does he like <laughs> listen to so many audio books and stuff like that? And I was like, ah, oh. and it's like stealing like an artist. Like I stole that from him. Mm -hmm. I stole it, obviously not steal because he's still got that aspect, but like yeah. I took that from him being like, I, I, I want to be like this. Like, you, like you're giving me inspiration to to want to learn loads. Mm. And that was like two years ago. But to be fair, I've always listened to podcasts. I've just never read. Mm. And I've never like took notes on when I was reading and stuff like that. Like over the past two years, I've read so much. And like, I will not get into my car and listen to music unless it's five o'clock in the morning going to the gym, which is five minutes away. If I get into my car, that is the zone to learn. And I'll put on a podcast, an audio book, if I'm going on a walk, another opportunity to learn. If I wake up and I don't have my phone on me because it's downstairs, another opportunity to learn. Like if you're not like like it's just literal saying, and like it's like I am just I'm nothing special. I'm just another case study of knowledge is power. Yeah, and knowledge is wisdom, and knowledge is success. And if you continuously want to learn, you will be successful in anything. Like you could like just learn as much as you can, but just like, it's just that thing. Like people don't want to put in the effort. I didn't want to put in the effort mm. until two years ago because I've seen it benefiting someone so much. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I want to do that. And like this year already, I've read like six books. I fucking love learning. It's that old thing, which is like, if you're not moving forward, you're, you're going backwards. Yeah. And also like, if you're not, uh, if you're not learning or earning in a job, you should, you should leg it and try and find something else. But like, <laughs> like just, yeah. Like knowledge is power. Like like best people to listen to if people are out there and being like, oh, I don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. I like just go on YouTube, listen to Jim Rohn, listen to Jordan Peterson, listen to Gary V, listen to David Goggins, Joe Rogan, Stephen Bartlett, uh, Modern Wisdom. So Chris Williamson, Rob Dial, Love him, yeah, where with the mindset mentor. Like there's eight people I've just reeled off that I listen to probably every week. Yeah. Like just and if people just made the switch from maybe digest and netflix and instead yeah to that. that's a hard one because i do love a good film <laughs> um and i'll watch like one film every two weeks um exactly but you're watching one every two weeks not, yeah not one every evening. but it's that thing of like people listen to this and being like oh i watch netflix a lot and that's fine but like it's not it's not like the hours of downtime mm. that that to damage your success it's what you're doing in the hours of when you're working i love that 100 i mean i i work quite long hours, but I always say to people and people in my team, I don't care if you work one hour a day, it's what you do with that time. If you can perform as well as everybody else with one hour, do it. That's it. That's and like that. my brother, like 
he'll do like nine to five, but he's fucking effective yeah. and efficient in then nine to five. And to be fair, he will. He, like if anything he's doing, he does it. But it's like he's so efficient in them nine to five hours that he doesn't need to yeah. need to like because I plan a script and my content creation is such a long winded process. I need to work those extra hours. Yeah. And that is probably something that early on I didn't understand. I was like, why are you working so little and I'm working loads? Mm. And it's just a job role. Yeah. Massively. My uh, my wife said if you're getting Ben on, you have to you have to ask him what uh the best long term luxury item investment is at the moment. Um like we don't really touch MS, but it'll probably be an MS Bacon or Kelly. Um how come? Just because like you you can't get them in retail unless like you're a vip customer or you've been on the wish list for like four or five years and mm. um, you can only get them if like um you buy them at resellers and like that would be, they'll be brand new but it would just be someone's bought it and then selling it straight away so you could buy it for like eight grand retail they are and like they're selling for like upwards of 15k so like 15 20 25 depending on which one you get and um, but accessible ones you'd probably say like a chanel classic flap just like the medium size um they went up recently so like about five years ago they were like five thousand dollars and now they're like they just went up two days ago and they're like ten thousand two hundred dollars wow. so yeah like with them it's not that you could buy a chanel and sell it for more it's mm. you could buy a chanel have it for five to ten years and sell it for pretty much what you bought it for yes which you've had the chanel bag for yeah. free for five years exactly i swear i didn't plan this yeah I bought some new trainers. Okay. And I brought them with me because yeah. I stayed in London overnight. Yeah, yeah I've yeah. got you've got to check them for you, me. What like real or fake? Yeah. Are they pre loved, pre owned? They're from StockX. Okay, let's see. <laughs> what brand? Uh Nike Dunks. Okay. I don't deal with Nike though, but I did go to the Soul Supplier the other day. Because and... I heard something about StockX that the it's getting there are some fakes on there, right? Uh, mm, I don't know. I don't want to get sued. <laughs> uh, we, can, we can cut that bit out. Um, <laughs> um, imagine no, this, like, nah, imagine there, was, nah, there was an article yeah. about like saying they sold fakes, but apparently it was like Nike execs putting fakes on there or something just to try and catch them out so they could sue them. Uh, but um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. There's a Google story. Uh, you have to Google a story about that. But like we don't deal with Nikes in it, mm. so I wouldn't like to say. Um, but they look pretty good What's to me. Got to tell you? They look pretty good to me. Imagine if you came on, you was like, nah, mate, they're fake. <laughs> no, um, yeah, the one, so I went to the Soul Supply the other day and they did a real versus fake with me with the dunks. It's actually on their TikTok if you want to yeah. go watch that video. But um, they look good to me. All right, sweet. When sweet. you're wearing dunks as well, not right now. Yeah. Just got a fresh pair. Yeah. <laughs> they're the only thing that I spend money on. Dunks. dunks. Just trainers. Yeah. Well, to be fair, all the decent trainers yeah. have got our dunks because... I just, I just, I've never been into spending a lot of money. And to be fair, like dunks aren't crazy, crazy money. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah. Like, um, I know, I know there's some that are, but you yeah, know, the Travis, the Travis Scott ones, I want so bad. They're really the hard dunks. to get, right? Yeah, the fifteen hundred quid on StockX. Jesus, but like, I want them so bad. But yeah, um, I've got a bad habit of buying trainers at the moment. Mm. I literally every time I come to London, I just go in the shop and I'm like, yeah, I love them. What are your favorite trainers? So at the moment, like, even like. I bought a pair of New Balance protection packs last time I came. Mm. They're so sick. Yeah. The Luna, the Lu Lu Chinese Lu Luna Moon or something like that. They're yeah. sick. They're a bit purpley. Um, but my favorite shoes, hmm, good question. Um, I wear my Louis Vuitton ones a lot. They're so mm. comfy. I'm wearing them now, actually. And then I bought Lanvin Curbs recently, which are mad. Mm. They're in my suitcase. I'll show you when we're finished. Yeah. Um, have a little Google of them later. They're fucking wild. Um, but I like them. They're comfy as well. I just like all shoes, man. Like, yeah. Yeah, like I deal with them every day. So like I see new ones and I'm like, oh, they're cool. Do you, do you, is that what you go for though? Like comfort kind of over? Yeah, like I couldn't yeah. care less what brand it is. Yeah. As long as they're comfy and they, yeah, yeah. they, they do the I love job that and though, because for a guy that runs a luxury, you know, company, you could be like, I don't care about the comfort, it's how they look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, I just want them to be fucking comfy Yeah, but feet. also like suit what I'm wearing that day. Yeah. Like obviously I'm into my style and stuff like that yeah, and yeah. I don't want to be wearing stuff that doesn't match. But yeah, like New Balance are class. I have like three or four pairs of them. And then like Nikes, I have a load of pairs yeah. of them. Hawkers, oh my God, yeah, I've got a pair of yeah, them. Yeah, I did, because I started running recently. Sick. So and, I, and I basically, I went on a half marathon and I got a bit of a like, I think I don't think it's a stretch, stress, stress fat fracture, but yeah. I think it's just a bit of tendonitis. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I was running in like crappy old Adidas, <laughs> Adidas shoes. Yeah. So I bought some Hawkers, yeah. Hawkers are beautiful. Anyway, everyone. It's like walking them. on a cloud. Yeah, me and my brother got like seven pairs between us. Really? It's fucking wild. Mate, 
What um, because you got into the industry with trainers, right? That was, that was your first few videos. Yes. Yeah. When did you start branching? Like, so I'm fascinated with this kind of thing because you can be an expert in, say, trainers. Yes. How do you start getting into the other aspects of goods? Because you have to like build up that knowledge. Yeah, of right? course. So like when we first started bags, it was like, yeah. so we, the, it's a funny story of how we started bags. So we were like, we just want to do footwear, just want to do clothing, don't want to do um, bags. It's too complicated. This was when we were like 18, when I was like 18, 19. And then like we had a client who was a wife of a famous footballer and she just brought loads of stuff and was like, just have all this. And I, we were like, okay. So we took it and there was bags in there and we were like, we're not really doing bags, but we'll just put them up. Mm. And then we put like three Balenciaga bags up, all same style, just different colors. And they sold like that. And we were like, hang on there. There's something, there's yeah, something, something, there's something we can work with here. Yeah. So yeah, we did that. And then like, it's like exactly how we got into footwear. Yeah. Research, courses, like knowledge, YouTube videos, asking people, go like we drove, we're based in Liverpool, we drove to Manchester once just to go to the Louis Vuitton shop and compare an item. Mm. Like we, we were just so hungry to learn. Yeah. And like like I said before, knowledge is power of your, like that's why we do loads of real versus fake videos mm. because like people love under, knowing, knowing. So like we, like we would just tell people how to do it. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with telling people how to do something. Do you find it's easier though to learn about something that you're truly, truly interested? Like trainers was obviously like a passion of yours. Was, yeah. Was it easier to yeah. get your head around, or even something like I imagine you don't wear or use a lot of these bags that you're selling? I wear designer bags, but like for example, like one more like female orientated yeah. bag. Bags. Yeah, I wouldn't wear them, but yeah, I got yeah, what you yeah. mean. And um, but like I love them. Right. Like, if we get a, a good, good, good bag. I'll be like my future girlfriend wife whoever she is <laughs> she is having this when we're yeah. together like this is like yeah I you're gonna this. be really good for that when you yeah. end up. Yeah, actually i don't understand why you are single because i'm sure you'd help a lot of girls out of that <laughs> what um what's been your going back to the team side of things what's been your biggest challenge with your team or like growing a team yeah so like maybe hiring too early for some roles yeah uh, and then like pushing them around the company but mm. still communicating with them really but like we would talk about it a lot and like rushing hiring so like we would hire someone like i said before not ready for the role and then like they weren't the right fit for the company either but mm. you do only understand whether they're the right fit for the company Once after start. they've been there yeah and like like i said after a month two months you like sit them down and be like look i'm really sorry i don't think we can go any further yeah. but that's just like that is like one of the only cons that i hate of having a company and hiring people is that letting people go fucking sucks. The worst, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And then you you come across like the dickhead because you're having to do the firing. Yeah. But it's it's horrible. Yeah. Like, no one I, wants to do it. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's like you come, like for me, like personally, it's not that I, I feel like I come across a dickhead. Yeah. It's I feel that like I was just unfair on them. Like mm. I'm really sorry. Like I, I've just wasted a month for two months of your life. But I hope you learned something from it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I hope you learned something. Like, yeah. But then again, like what I said at the beginning, like, what can you do? Have you changed your hiring process since you started? Yeah, so I read a book about a year ago called Surrounded by Idiots. Mm. Don't know if you've heard of it. I've heard of it. I've not read it. So it's like how people, so the first line in it is basically, no one's an idiot, you're all just different. And it's basically, you'll be onto the concept of how people are segmented by colors. So someone's a red, someone's a green, someone's a blue, someone's a yellow. So like, I'm a yellow. I'm like, want to be center of attention yeah, dead in your yeah. face like dramatic if you say something to me it will hurt my feelings but an hour later i'll, I'll forget you even said it yeah. and then like a red is like direct want the job done anyone mm. who gets a new way you're getting pushed out green is like 80 percent of people are green they'll they'll gossip but they'll do what they're told they're just like sheep mm. and then like um blues are like um very structured, like everything has to be done in a structured way. And you can be a mixture of colors. Like I would say I'm a yellow and a bit of a red. My brother's a blue and a bit of a red. Um, we have a lot of greens in our team, but you can't have greens without reds. You can't have yellows without red blues. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah, yeah. you need a red person to guide all those greens. So do you actually think about that while you're hiring? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So like if we, if we need someone to data input, it mm. can't be wrong. It needs to be done in a very structured, organized way. We're looking for someone who has 
huge aspects of blue mm. because that's what that role is. If yeah. we're looking for someone to go on camera to do a podcast, we're looking for a yellow. What yeah. are we if we're looking for just someone to fill a role for six months and they're the same, like they know that it's only six months, mm. we're looking for a green. Mm. If we're looking for um, someone to like spare the company on and like get all these partnerships done and do really good deals mm. and like get stuff done rapid, we're looking for a red. Like you, like it's a really good book reading. Yeah, no, I, I actually was speaking to one of our creators. I didn't know it was that book, but about that type of different colored personality types. So I have heard it. Um, but do you have a traditional hiring process? Because I feel like with a company like yours, it would probably yeah, be no. quite different. Yeah, hundred percent. So like we hired two people last week or like two weeks ago and like just get them into the office, have a chat. If we get on with you, if we speak yeah. to you for half an hour plus with no interruptions, you're hired. That's yeah, it. Love it. That's it. Like we yeah. we had like five interviews for this one role, mm. and like four of them we just couldn't have a conversation with. Yeah, it's massive. Isn't and like it? you ask a question, and like they just don't understand the questions. Like, like one question, which is massive, is like we want to be the biggest pre love luxury reseller in the world, and mm. this is on every interview we do. So mm. if you listen to this and you want to apply, this <laughs> yeah. is what will be coming. It's like how are you going to help us mm. reach reach our goal? Because at the end of the day, like if you're not going to help us, then we don't want you. Yeah, and like, like some of the answers you get off that are just like you can tell that they're, they're very ill prepared. But like, if someone's there just chilling and like you're having a conversation with them, and like, well, I really like your company, and I just want to see the company smash it because I've been following you for so long, and like, I'd love to be a part of it. And we're like, okay, yeah, you sound good. I love it when someone comes into an interview with me and goes, I ask them like questions about the agency, and then I say, have you got anything else to ask? And they go out of interest why are you not doing this uh, or like, like they like call something out that we've yeah, done yeah. wrong in the business and i'm like you're hired yeah, yeah, yeah immediately someone came down from scotland to our uh, she's like a she loves the brand mm. uh, and she came down and she was like just to like spend a day with us basically and she was like your launch for menswear was rubbish you know <laughs> i was like fucking is right like yeah. thank you so much yeah, for telling yeah. us that because we kind of knew yeah. but like it's just affirmation for someone to tell us and no one else is coming down and telling us that no. so like yeah it's class i love that you seem incredibly busy and you mm. talk and you, you've told me about how you you do so many videos you're working during the day how do you avoid burnout like simple like i just love it like i love <laughs> yeah. it so much like the moment i Wake up, I'm yeah. thinking about my company. Yeah, yeah. From the moment I go to bed, I'm thinking about my company. And probably mm. while I'm sleeping, I'm probably thinking about it. While I'm exercising yeah, in the gym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When yeah. I'm exercising in the gym, doing the circuits, yeah. I'm thinking about what I can yeah. do that day. Like, it, 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 so like growing up, if you told me from the ages of eight to 16 or six to 16 that I could play football every single day, I would be like, yes, yes let's do I'm going to do it. Yeah. And like a lot of people resonate with that and be like, yeah, so could I. This is the exact same as yeah. I am in now. Like I'm making videos, building a business, building a team every single day. Like mm. I say this to my team all the time. Like even though I founded the company, I feel so lucky to be a part of it. Mm. Like Because I, I never thought I'd be able to produce something like this, but I never thought I'd be able to be involved in something like this. Like when I was a kid, I didn't think I was good enough to be... Um, turning over what we turn over, build a, build a business like this. Be like, I went to London the other week and someone from Canada came over asking for a picture, being like, I love you on TikTok. Mm. Like, like we have created something humorous. Is that weird when someone comes up to you? Like having that, I don't know, that now a persona that people can just walk up to you and be like, hey, can I have a photo? Yeah. Um, like, I, I love it. I can't lie. Uh, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it is. A nice, like, it's, it's a nice sick. ego boost. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, sick. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, like if you're if you're confident enough and like put yourself out there enough to come up mm. to me and ask me something, like yeah, too right, you can have a picture. Like, like yeah. I'm not bothered. Like, like I'm no celebrity at all. Like I'm just known in a niche, which which is like happy days for the company. But I don't think from your your trajectory, I don't think it's gonna be long until you're in that niche of being a a bit of a celebrity. Well, that's the aim. Yeah. Like as a yellow personality as well, especially yeah. like the aim is to get ultra, ultra, yeah. ultra, ultra known because it would get the business known. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like my fully, full on folk, like when I started this, it wasn't to get known, it was to build a company. And now it's to get, like now I'm, like, I'm known in, in the industry and I'm known from like fans of the brand mm. and stuff like that. It's like, I've had a little taste of it. Yeah, I want a little bit more. Do, do you ever, because we were talking about this a minute ago when we were walking through there. What, what's your do you ever have any i guess fears about having yourself such a part of the success uh, of looks uh, because a lot of businesses 
have been built on the founder. Yeah. And then the founder is the brand. And without the founder, there's no brand. Yeah, I'm aware that like, w- w- without me producing the content in the company, say if we were to sell, which we're not, but yeah. if we were to sell, yeah. I would have to be in it for two to five years, whatever. Or like, yeah, like I am a key person mm. in in the company. But like, so the sole supplier, I've been spending a lot of time with the founder recently, George, sick mm. man, love him. And um, he's taught me so much in such a sh- short period of time. And he, the reason I started Lux Collective was because mm. I used to watch his videos on YouTube back in the day. Oh, really? So I started YouTube videos because of him. He stopped doing YouTube videos in about 2019. Mm. And he reached out to me being like, love what you're doing. Well, I reached out to him and then a year later, he reached back out to me being like, bro, you need to teach me how to do TikTok. Mm. So like we've kind of like networked that way. And I go down to his office, he comes down to mine with two TikTok strategy and he'll teach me SEO and stuff like that. But anyway, the point is he told me the biggest regret of his is get coming off the videos. Mm. He built up such a such an audience and brand awareness. Why did he come off? Because he was being the CEO. He was genuinely being the CEO of the business, mm. pushing the team on um, onwards and upwards and developing tech. And they did a cracking job. Yeah. But their brand used to be like 50% brand, 50% mm. um, tech. Yeah. Now it's like 20% brand, 80% tech. Yeah. So like he's put the fear up my ass and being like, <laughs> do not get off the videos. Yeah. Is he like, do you see him as a bit of a mentor now for you then? Yeah, definitely. Do you think mentors are important? Like I've never had a mentor. I've always wanted one. Mm. And like, yeah, I've, I've never had a mentor and everyone keeps telling me you should get one. And I'm like, where do you begin? Yeah. Just reach out to people and go like, can you be my mentor, please? Well, I think you've got to look at people who inspire you and just reach out to them. And if they yeah. say no, that's the worst they can say. Yeah, exactly. Um, with George, it kind of just happened naturally. So like he is about 10 years older than me, nine years older than me. Mm. And like, like, yeah, like we just text all the time, like different ideas. And mm. he's, I'm teaching him stuff as much as he's teaching me stuff. So like, it's a very exchange value friendship and relationship. And um, yeah, like, he's definitely improved the way I've looked at certain things, but like I haven't had a mentor that's been like my accountability partner or being like, but like, Mm. that's what me and Joe are for. Yeah. Joe's only just moved out at the weekend to his house finally. Um, Oh, so you've been living together as well? Yeah. 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 For like, for like since yesterday. That is intense. Yeah. But, but like, it's just not like, (laughs) I I get why people would think it is, but like, we're so like if, if we're just chilling we know when to speak to each other and when not to like we mm. could be in a room for eight hours all day and not speak to each other yeah like it's honestly like our relationship a lot of people must look at it and be like how do you spend so much time with each other how come you moved out then um he just he has girlfriends and they yeah. want a house and life in it yeah, like that's that's what it's i think it's for a lot of people it's the natural next step because he's 27 still living at home with his parents yeah. you know what i mean yeah i'm gonna live at home <laughs> For the foreseeable, this is care. this is mental to me that you're running a multi multi million pound business and yeah. you live at home. Uh-huh. What do your parents like say day to day? Just like are they still working? Uh, my dad's a retired police officer. My yeah. mom is like a freelance yoga teacher. Okay, so like very laissez faire. But my dad does like he works at like a um, special needs home. Oh wow! Um, and then on weekends a ref, football referee. So mm. busy, still yeah, busy. Yeah. Um, but like just to keep busy um, but yeah like I just come home at about 7, 8 o'clock and they're like have you had a good day and I'm like yeah I'm going to bed I'm tired and they're like okay see you in the morning do they <laughs> kind of comprehend the social media side of and how big it is yeah yeah so my mum's got like 25,000 followers on really? Instagram yeah so over lockdown she would do like a yoga slash style oh, wow. page and like she just did it off her own back yeah yeah like just because it was That's like a, like this for you is a yeah. passion project for her yeah yeah so like but like they, I don't think they they understand the numbers. Like when I say mm. we had 60 million views last month. That's what I mean. Like, do they get they're it? They're like, oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny because Amy's parents are like this. They they try and want to be involved and they try and want to ask questions, especially her dad who's run a business. Yeah. But he'll say things like, just go sign Ed Sheeran. Yeah. Like just go sign yeah, Ed Sheeran. Yeah, and yeah, you're yeah. like, that's not. Yeah. Uh, so he kind of, he kind of comprehends it, but he kind of doesn't yeah, comprehend yeah, it yeah. at the same time. That's funny that. It's honestly, mate, it used to be so frustrating because I'd be like, I would if I could. Yeah. Like, yeah, if it was that easy. I think back in the day, it would have been different. Like you probably, 
Because like, there's probably like a million people trying to sign Ed Sheeran, whereas back in the day, it was only the people who genuinely believed they could sign Ed Sheeran would sign Ed Sheeran. Oh yeah. Do you know 100%. what I mean? Yeah. Have you had any people now, because I watched another one of your talks the other day, or it might be the podcast, but you were saying nobody else is doing what you're doing and you feel very lucky that no one else has tried to really copy you. Yeah. Have I, you seen a rise in that? In um, smaller businesses, no. Um, we've we've kind of gone into other people's niches now right so we started at footwear yeah there's a lot of small time donnie's doing it on instagram which is sick like fucking get you yeah, done yeah. like d build your brand sick um like we were saying before at the beginning it's abundant everything's abundant yeah like and it's, it's a compliment yeah yeah, yeah for yeah. sure the, the annoying thing is is just when people copy our content mm. and like word for word copy our scripts it's like why but then it, that is reinforcement to us that we are the best yeah because they're copying us um but like We've kind of gone into like, but we're mid luxury. So like our competitors down in London, they focus on Hermes and Chanel. We right. don't, we focus on Gucci, Balenciaga, YSL, um, Off-White. Like we focus on the mid range and no one's in that mid range. Mm. Like no, no one is at the volume of that mid range that we're in that mid range. Mm. Um, and that's why we get so many people because we, we, our content's created for the masses, not just the fucking ultra rich who can afford the, Birkins and the Kellys mm. from Hermes. How do you think, because uh, as I mentioned to you before this, I grew up fairly near to Liverpool. Yeah. I've always loved to live people from Liverpool, got friends in Liverpool, went to university there. Sick. They're quite a unique uh, set of people. Yeah. Do you think that's had an effect on, like I can just tell from talking to you that this is, the, I know the answer to this question, but do you yeah. think that you've had, that's had a big effect on the way in which you run your business? Um, In terms of what way do you reckon? Every passionate. every person I know from Liverpool yeah. is outgoing, yeah. passionate, will talk to you for four hours, yeah. like wants to be your friend. Yeah, so just like that. Uh, uh, Extrovert, yeah, one, yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like just the personality traits you get yeah. from being uh, friend, from Liverpool. Fr as friendly as they can be, would die for you in a heartbeat yeah. when they've met you once, that kind of vibe. And I feel like from talking to you about the way in which you deal with your team and you back them and the way you, you deal with clients, it seems like that's had quite a big effect. Yeah, I feel like like... I don't know whether this is from growing up in Liverpool, but like, I feel like that's genuinely the only option. Like you need yeah. to make the people who work for you feel like they can fly. Yeah, yeah. Like if you're not doing that, then you're not a good yeah. boss. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, there'll be some days where my energy's low, I'm tired, and I'm mm. not making you feel like you can fly. But if I'm doing it 90% of the time, if I'm, if I'm praising you, if I'm pushing yeah. you on, if I'm giving you opportunities, if I'm letting you be free, like that is making employees feel like they can fly. Yeah. And that's what you got to do. And I feel like, I come down to London and speak to some Donnies and they're like, like it dead monotone and dead like this and this, but they're fucking really good at what they do. Yeah. But like, I just think we approach it at a different angle. Like we're enthusiastic, we're like passionate, like extroverted. Exactly Honestly, at any time that I've ever been around anybody from Liverpool, yeah. they're always the loudest person. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, when yeah, I've been yeah. around, like, as I say, I used to play rugby with a lot of people from Liverpool. When you had them together in a room, yeah, it was like you know all of is, them though? were trying to be the loudest, the most well known. S Scousers are just so proud of being Scousers. Yeah, man. Yeah. Like there's a lot of people where like I yeah. love that. Yeah, I think yeah, it's yeah. brilliant. That, and that's what that's what gives gives off that vibe yeah. of like wanting to be like the loudest in the room. Like they're so proud of where they come from and they're so proud about what the what the city holds as a as a, as a whole. Yeah. Do they want to let people know that I think it's I, I genuinely think it's one of the, the best traits about some of your content is that it's loud and it's and it's uh -huh. do you know what I mean? Like it's an engaging like Paddy Pimp is it Paddy Paddy yeah, 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 Paddy the Buddy. Yeah, yeah. One of the best things about yeah, him is sick. just his personality. Yeah, he's class. Let alone he's a fucking sick fighter. Do you know what's mad though? It's like there's not that many entrepreneurs well known from Liverpool. Well, I was going to say, like, I can't really rattle them off in my yeah, head. You know, there's not Mu many. You know, musicians, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. footballers, you know, the cultural side of things is massive. But entrepreneurs, it, yeah. it, I, th I feel like it's because the opportunity is limited there. And that's why right. I love going to London so much because mm. I come here and be like, Oh my god! I've just had three meetings when I only had to plan when I was only coming down for one yeah. because they linked me with them just because I mentioned something, and like I feel like that's what it is like with Liverpool. Like it's very small city. But I love what you're doing because I'm assuming you're, you're never going to move away from Liverpool. Like uh, no, our HQ is always going to be there. Yeah, because it's kind of similar to what um, Ben's done with. Well, in the northwest. With, yeah. It's simply similar to what Ben's done with Gymshark and kept it in Birmingham. Birmingham yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like not, no one was in Birmingham. Uh -huh. No one wanted to be in Birmingham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that Lounge is in Birmingham as well, yes. I think. I think they're in the same industrial park. But um, you almost have this thing, this opportunity now to build. Yeah. 
a huge company yeah, yeah. in Liverpool. Well, that's what that's, that's so motivational for you. Yeah, I feel like that's definitely what, what something I want to achieve in terms of like like building something in in a place that like like I I don't know like a, a big thing that not many big things in terms of business has come out of like mm. like you said before class mm. footballers class yeah, musicians yeah. but business wise I don't know whether I'm being naive here but I genuinely can't think of many who've no. come from Liverpool no I admit I, I can't off the top of my head and it's not something I've, I've thought about but I think what's cool to see is there's been quite a big rise in Manchester with yeah. businesses I feel like that's with fast fashion as well it has been yeah. and it's like all that, like PLT and yeah yeah like and that. that's going to be gone soon yeah like I think Boohoo and PLT like because they're owned by the same group and like they mm. are like the monsters of that industry they will stay but like their market share and market growth will decline but like yeah, like I wonder where the next area is. To, well, to I mean, Liverpool. Liverpool. Possibly. You've got the opportunity there now with the business that you're running to have it be Liverpool. And you have a lot of people that, you know, workforce-wise that were in Manchester maybe need, needing to go over to Liverpool. That's a good point. Like, Because you're not far, are you? Yeah, no, not at all. Like talent is hard to find, to be fair. So hard. Um, and especially trying to, if we get them externally, trying to get them to Liverpool because it's just so far out of the way. It's yeah. northwest. It's like really up high. Yeah. So like we're building currently... A custom built unit it's going to be about twelve thousand square foot be ready this time next year well we're ready in november but we're going to be moving this time next year and like we're just making it the sickest place it can be so we can attract the talent mm. like i've got an interview with someone from london next week and like i'm gonna try and she's coming down to the office and i'm trying to i'm gonna try and convince her to come i don't know whether she will mm. but like i'm just gonna show her look we're building the biggest in the world if you want to be a part of it you can do because i fucking love your attitude love what you what you can give us but just trying to take someone from London so hard, man. Well, it's the, it's the money side. Well, to be fair, though, I, I've seen a big, big influx of people from London, at least in this industry, move to Manchester. Okay, there's an that's inf- good news there's for an, Yeah, there's an influence marketing spa- uh, like yeah, there industry is. in Manchester. Yeah, there is. And I've seen, there's even people that I've been interviewing lately, and they've said that they've, they still work in London, but they're, they're now living in Manchester because of the cost of living in London. Yeah. So the, that plays in your favour because of how expensive it is. Yeah, yeah, there. yeah. Well, yeah, like you can offer like, I don't know, like 20% less, is it? 10% less? Yeah. 10% less probably sounds right. Yeah. Yeah, not 20. <laughs> yeah. Like it's five to 10% less in salary mm. because like the cost of living is just nowhere near as no, much as li- exactly. London. Exactly. So I, I think like you're saying, it's one of those, it's, if you build it, they'll come. Yeah, that's you know it. It's I mean? like building the hub. Yeah. Of like, like, the place to come to to work like to work in our industry like if you yeah. want to be in the pre-loved luxury industry get to there's only one yeah, place yeah. To, to go to because it's the sickest and that's what we're trying and to you've do. got to be fair the thing that you do have that you can sell is that it's a sick city yeah it's yeah, got yeah. so much to offer yeah 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 like not just in terms of sport but the culture there the restaurants like it's amazing yeah it's class people just don't know it when you come to london as much yeah well yeah i always ask that obviously when i get in taxi like where are you from our liverpool have you ever been though do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. The, the, like, yeah. Mate, well, this has been amazing. Um, my mum's downstairs. Is she? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's got it. I'm taking her home to see my little girl over the weekend. One question I do want to ask everybody that comes through this, and I think this is very, very apt for you, is what's your one tip for keeping a positive mindset? Um, oh, probably like, what's the alternative? fucking love that do you know what i mean yeah like yeah it if you're like happiness is a choice at the end of the day like if if you wake up and you are not happy that day because of reasons you've put in your heads like someone's not cooked your tea the night before someone's not able to give you a lift to work yeah. And you're choosing to be unhappy. The weather's bad. Mm. Um, the Uber's not coming quicker enough. Like you're choosing these things. Like yeah. just look at it and be like, oh, that's life. It's not life <laughs> and death, like you said earlier. No, like like literally like anything that happens to you, just that's life. That's what was meant to happen. That's what is happening. If I want to change it, then I've got to I've got to take actions to change that. So the night before I've got to pre-book my taxi. The night before I've got to lay my clothes out so I'm not in a rush. Like just you're in control and the moment that you admit and choose that you're in control and everything becomes like free i love that it's one of the best ben thanks thank you very much thanks i've enjoyed it mate